Indeed. All right. So congratulations to the Kalers, Cynthia, and Tracy. But I want to say Taj and Sage are leaving now. They're, congratulations to you, your uncles again, right? <laughs> There's the two uncles. They're going <laughs> out the side. But, uh, you know, they're in South Carolina, right? The Armstrongs, no? Florida, right, right. Why did I think South Carolina? Well, your daughter is in college, I know, who will be getting married soon. We're going to talk about that next week. It's hard being, being far away, though, whether it's South Carolina or Florida. We're in Hawaii. They're on the mainland. When I moved to Florida, uh, when my son was born, Dominic was the first baby in the family, and he was a boy. Now, that's a big thing for an Italian. <laughs> you have three grandsons now. But for us, it was, uh, I was the first uh, boy in the Cuso family when I was born, 1955. And uh, my grandparents, Cuzos, made a big thing about that. I, I, and uh, when I was born, they said, we have another Cuzo to carry on the name, you know, because the, the, ma the male, you marry a woman, and you, Terry is a Cuzo now. <laughs> we had talked about that before we got married. It was like, you know, <laughs> I said, oh, you're going to be a Cuzo. <laughs> and uh, so uh, <laughs> when Dominic was born, it was a big thing. We had a home birth. I delivered Dominic myself in our house in Toms River, New Jersey, and uh, we went through all that, and it was so much fun. <laughs> you want to have excitement in your life, have a baby at home. Anyway, it was great, but I remember my uh, mom and dad came on Saturday. It was Saturday uh, around noontime, and my parents usually visited us from the north of New Jersey. They went south Jersey, where I was, Tom's River, down the Jersey Shore. They, hey, we're here, and, and you can hear my wife in the bedroom. Ah, ah, ah. My mother goes, what's the matter? I said, the ba Dominic is being born, the baby, you know, and she's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> well, the father left. We're going to Uncle Junior's or somebody, my other uncle, Frank Cuzo, was there. Call us when it's over. That was what we heard. And so Dominic came that night. They came over. Of course, my father was held him, and, you know, he's crying, a very happy occasion. Then a year and a half after that, we moved to Florida. <laughs> so a doctor in Florida told Brother Gabe a little bit about, you know my story about salvation, but when we were getting on the plane to leave for Florida, can you imagine my parents? This is the first grandchild named after my dad, Dominic. He was Dominic, my father. Man, it was like a funeral. <laughs> it wasn't a happy occasion for leaving. And every time when they came to Florida, went back to New Jersey, it was like crying all over again. Anybody have that? <laughs> Anybody have that experience? It's, it's tough. My mother says she still doesn't forgive me. She's not here this morning. She's 90 years old. I remember the day, and she remembers what he was wearing. He has a little baseball outfit on with his little cap, and he got on the plane, and I can't believe you moved away and took, like we took him from her, say, from them. My dad used to say, every time I talked to him on the phone, for 20 years I lived in Florida, for 20 years. When are you moving back? For 20 years I heard that. When, I, when he first came to Florida, he opened up a suitcase. I thought he was going to have all kinds of goodies, salami, a prosciutto. No, he, had a, he had made up a newspaper. Somebody, a printer, made up a look like a real newspaper. Frank Cuzo comes back to New Jersey. What's the headline? I'm serious. So <laughs> these are tough, tough, tough things, but we got through it. There were some things uh, that it was better for us to be in Florida, they're going to say, what? Don't you miss your family? I'm sure I miss my family. I moved to Florida. I was not a Christian. I was not saved. You know, I got saved five or six months after we moved. Moved in March. Got saved July 8, 1982. It would have been very hard for me in New Jersey to bring up and to raise our, our son. And then Tina was born in Florida as a Christian in a Christian home. Because when I got saved, you know, everything changed the way we lived and what we did and how we entertainment and where we went and what we drank and how we ate. Well, we still ate pretty much the same, <laughs> but things changed and it would have been a real shock. We, we were 20 years in Stewart, Florida, north of Palm Beach County, and we raised our kids in a Christian home. We, we went to a great church, independent fundamental church, almost identical doctrinally to this church. And uh, God was good to us. Was it easy to be away from your family? No. But there were some advantages when it came to uh, raising your children and other things that God used it. So the question today in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we said, well, that was what we read last week. I know we're going to be in this book, not, not 
as long as we're in Romans, <laughs> or as long as we're going to be in Psalms, or 150 Psalms. It's a short book. They call it Minor Prophets, but there's nothing minor in this book. It's a message about God and his people. In the Old Testament, we know that. The nation of Israel, God's chosen people, chosen to bring the Messiah into the world. The Christianity, we say in the New Testament, the church, we're to make God known to a lost and dying world. God didn't forget about Israel. He'll never forget about Israel. But we didn't replace Israel, right? Israel's going to be used of God even in the last days. And Christianity came out of Judaism when you look at it. Jesus brought up Mary and Joseph, Jewish disciples, all Jewish. Its foundations, its base is based on what God made covenant relationships with Israel and promises and prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ. And what we see in the Old Testament, we say in like seed form, especially in Genesis chapters 1 to 11, is fully developed in the New Testament. And so Habakkuk say, Old Testament doesn't have anything to do with us. No, yes it does. And it lets us know, it's a, again, 66 books in the Bible. It has 66 things God wants us to know about himself. And we see him in Habakkuk. He's the author of every word, every jot and every tittle in the Bible is God and the Holy Spirit is the divine author. So no matter who it is or what the story is about, it's about God ultimately. And there's a question here asked by Habakkuk in verse 3, the very first word. And this is a word that people told me when we're going through tragedies in your life and difficulties and trials that you're not to ask this question. <laughs> I heard many a, a message and preacher preach on don't ask God why. Well, Habakkuk here, I'm sorry, he asked. And I've done that. And I'm, I don't know if you have. I, I would venture to just take a wild guess and say that some of you asked that question as well. Because it's our, our nature. Because we don't understand. I don't understand <laughs> the way things are happening in our society and in the world. And we cry out to God, Why? Why aren't you doing anything? You know, but the fact is God is doing and he is working. And God does not obligate it to answer me or any of us and to tell, well, let me sit down with you, uh, Pastor Frank, and I'll tell you every little detail of my plan. No, he has a plan. He's in control. He's sovereign. And his will is being done. may not be the way we would choose it. But here, again, Israel was in a tough time. If you look at the king at the time of of uh, Habakkuk was king of Judah, the southern kingdom. Remember, they were divided into the north and the south. Jehoiakim, and you study about his father, his name was Josiah. If you study about Josiah, the king, he was a good king, one of the few, one of the few, very few. And it says he did all that was right in the sight of the Lord. He cleaned out all the idols and all the, the groves. You hear of all this pagan idolatry and worship. But what happened? One generation, Jehoiakim comes in, bad, terrible king. Yeah, that happens sometimes, and, and it, that's another reason. Why did this happen? You see people, good godly people, a husband and a wife, a good marriage, a good Christian people, they're faithful, they serve the Lord, they have children one day, the kids grow up, and something happens to the kids, and they don't serve the Lord, right? It doesn't take much more than one generation and that's why when the Bible says, earnestly contend for the faith in Jude, but that faith must be handed down our doctrine, our beliefs to every generation. Because all it takes for people to, to go astray and go away from the foundations of our faith is one generation, the next generation. We must be careful. That's why parents, and, and especially in the Old Testament, in Proverbs, and, and in many other books, it's, it's the responsibility. When you're going to have a child, this is a soul, a, a human soul, it's a very big responsibility. We used to say that uh, some people maybe shouldn't have had children <laughs> because what happens is they don't, they're not responsible parents. And then, of course, we see the child and the evil and the things they do. We want to blame the child, but you've got to look back to the parents most of the time. Not all the time, but there are times when the parents did not fulfill their God-given responsibility. Train up your child is not for the school. It's for the parents, amen? The school and the church are to assist the parents as best as they can. But we, have, we don't even have many children now because of COVID, but when we did, if you have 10, 12 kids, they're here Sunday morning, Sunday school, maybe Sunday morning, Sunday night, maybe a five, 
uh, Friday night teen Bible study or something during the week, that's maybe two or three hours a week. There's a, there's a hundred, <laughs> how many hours in a week? You, you figure it out, 24 times seven. What are they doing all those other hours? <laughs> TV, video games, hanging around with bad friends, public school, which uh, doesn't teach everything good either. And so they're bombarded. And so when we ask why this happens, we have the answer. <laughs> and what we're trying to do here is what we can do so it doesn't happen and how uh, we can answer this question. You know, Habakkuk, you know what the word means, his word? Everyone's name usually meant something, especially the Old Testament. It means one who embraces. I like that name. Habakkuk wrapped his arms, in this book you'll see, around God and, and was looking and asking God for an answer. He desired to know why. And although his prayer was given a long time ago, we today, in 2021, we can ask the same questions that he asked God, the same problems. Habakkuk chapter 1, look at verse 1 uh, through 3 again real quick. The burden, you know, it's funny, it says the burden which he saw. Usually a burden is something in your heart that you carry around and you bring it to the Lord and you ask others to pray. I have, I have a burden deep in my heart. This was something that he saw, and he even says here, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt, what, not hear? God hears everything. Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? He says, why, in verse 3, why dost thou show me and cause me to see or behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me? And there are those that raise up strife and contention, and then... Verse 4, therefore the law is slacked and judgment does never go forth. I always wonder, the people that are doing things, even today, he was saying the same thing there, and nothing happens. <laughs> it's like, like they're getting away with things, that, that people should be in jail. We have laws, we're a nation of rules and laws, or at least we used to be. And he had that same problem. He says, Wilt thou not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity? Again, the question of why. Little three-letter word. Then it's the question that all men and women ask, but there's sometimes no real readily given answer. He was a very troubled man living in a dark hour in history. You say, well, 2021. He cried out to God and asking why the Lord would not hear and why would he allow this to happen? Have you ever said that? I'm saying that a lot lately. Why have, again, God allowed this to happen? Remember that this time that this was written, Habakkuk, the nation of Israel was right on the eve. It was about to be taken over, captive. And even when Josiah, you know, King Jehoiakim's father served and was a good king, God told him because he was a good king, he would, he would spare through his time as a king that this would happen, but there was a coming judgment even under a good king because the why? The people had strayed from God, and he tried to do all he could, King Josiah, Jehoiakim's father, then Jehoiakim came in. Forget it. Everything that his father did changed. Sounds familiar. And so the nation of Israel on the eve of being taken over, we were watching a movie last night about World War II when the Nazis came into Poland. And what they did in the ghetto there, the Warsaw ghetto with the, with the Jews and how they were treated. And true story that we saw in the movie. But here, Israel, on the eve of being taken captive by the wicked king Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, maybe one of the mightiest nations at that time, of course, in the world then. And he's a famous king, not only in the Bible, but in world history. These things are definitely truly happened. They had Babylon, you know, Babylonian uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. The city was the perimeter, if you said you wanted to draw a circle around it, over 60 miles, uh, just in this one city. The walls were as high as a football field is long, 100 yards high. They were wide enough, the walls around Babylon, so that they used to have chariot races around the top of the walls. And inside Babylon, one of the ancient wonders of the world, they called the Hanging Gardens that the king had built for his wife. And, you know, because of his great power and might, Nebuchadnezzar felt, I can do anything I want, and nothing's going to happen to me. 
And one of his desires was to take the nation of Israel and Judah, spe specifically at first, captive. And so the king of Judah now, the Israelite king Jehoiakim of the southern kingdom. Remember Jeremiah? Last week we talked about, again, Habakkuk and Jeremiah were contemporaries of one another, lived at the same time, preached at the same time. And he went and gave a message about maybe if you'd repent and turn back to God, just maybe God would spare us. What did the king do with the message that he had written? Remember Baruch? He had written it down on a scroll, and he brought it in there to the princes, and they read it, and they got a, a, a kind of a little razor blade. You know those pen knife razor blades with a little tip? And he says, let's take this part right here. And threw it in the fire. Can you imagine that? Jehoiakim heard the message, took a pen knife, cut the word of God out to pieces, and threw it in the fire, in essence saying, I don't care what God says, I want nothing to do with your God and with his word. And of course we know what happened. If you ask Habakkuk at the moment how things were going in his nation, he might sound like me. <laughs> he might find it in his answer again, why? Why is this happening? He could not believe it. He says the wicked, in verse 4, compass about, surround the righteous and wrong judgment proceeded. Today, it's what men call good evil and evil good. <laughs> it happened that back then as well. It seemed to Habakkuk that the, the evil people that, that were winning, and it bothered him immensely, and it bothers me too. And you think about our country. Uh, it seems as though sometimes the wicked are winning for the battle for the hearts and minds of our nation, our young people, and the battle of good versus evil. And as we look at spiritual darkness, and it is dark in our nation, we ask God, why? Why does God allow things to take place? Well, God may say to us, well, remember, you took prayer out of school, and you took my word out of here, you're taking scripture out of everywhere, you're killing uh, newborn souls, babies, murder, that's what abortion is, amen? Uh, uh, so many millions of, th this is really a sin a tragic one of many sins of our nation, gender identity. I mean, on and on we can go about our country. Uh, people want to take the history. Hey, hey, there is no nation that has a perfect history, just like there's no perfect human beings. And they want to go back and say our country is steeped in uh, racial things. And, of course, there was a history, but our Constitution, if you read it, is not. All right? Our Constitution is not racist. It's for all people. And things have changed over the years, but there are some people that still think we're inherently racist and want to change everything about our history, tear down statues. In fact, they'd love to tear up our Constitution and give us a new uh, socialist, communist type of deal. Anyway, we know, here's the thing. <laughs> I know we're not supposed to, and I've heard this from many preachers to ask God why, but we wonder. But we wonder. Uh, a holy God must be as upset, probably much more so, than I am or we are. Why does God allow this to happen? He's a omnipotent, a holy, perfect, sinless, righteous, sovereign God. Well, the same question was even in the heart of the disciples in the New Testament. I want to read just really quick from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. They traveled with Jesus one day. You'll remember this story. It says, John chapter 9, verse 1 through 4, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And the disciples said to Jesus, Master, who did sin? In other words, why is this? When years ago, when people had diseases and disorders, they thought that it was some evil thing they had done. Remember when Job got sick, all of his best friends came in and said, Boy, you must have been doing something really bad for God to do this to you. And of course, he didn't do anything wrong. Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither. I think they were a little surprised to hear that because they thought for sure he's going to tell them probably the father or the mother. No, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but what? That the works of God should be made manifest in him. That's why God was going to do something. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day, for the night cometh when no man can work. And we could say that in 2021. We must be busy about the Lord's business. So the disciples want to know why, <laughs> just like Habakkuk and just like me. 
Why had God allowed this child to be born blind? Was it a sin, the sin of his parents? And Jesus said, no, neither. But the works of God should be demonstrated, manifest, shown through him. Of course, we know Jesus healed him. In other words, God had a plan and a purpose for this young, blind man, and he had a work to do in his life, and he did it. Someone may ask, why would God allow a terrible thing to take place in my home? Why doesn't God save my son, my daughter? Why doesn't God bring my daughter back? Why has God allowed my husband to leave me? Why uh, did such and such, uh, my parents, die young? Why does she have cancer? Why is a question that's almost always asked, it is, but most times not immediately answered. Maybe not answered at all in our lifetime. Sometimes prayers are not answered until you get to heaven, amen? I want to look at some things real quick here from God's Word that may help us answer the question of why. I hope it helps you. Number one, you have to know this. God loves you. God loves you, and he loves me, amen? I don't know how, could, how he could, why he'd love us, but we can't understand anything unless we first know God loves us. Jeremiah, one of the contemporaries, right? We mentioned already about Habakkuk's contemporary. Jeremiah 31.3, God said to him, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. That's different than our love, Amen. There's nothing, you know, that there's nothing that you or I could do that make, to make God stop loving us. We can do it to each other very easily. Nothing. While it's easy, it's easy to love somebody that's nice and friendly to you and says nice things to you and treats you well, but it's very difficult. God loves the very vilest of sinners as much as he loves you and I. God loves the worst sinners. John 3.16 says God so loved the world. That means everyone. Good, bad, terrible, vile, the worst of the worst. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, right, but have everlasting life. So that's available to all. Romans 5.8, one of my favorite verses when they lead someone to Christ, says, but God demonstrated, commended, showed his love toward us. How? While we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Not when we were at our best. You know, I was brought up in a system where you, you had to do things, works, sort of get points with God. And then until I came to a point where I said, man, I'm a sinner. I do not deserve salvation. The only way I can get saved is to come to Christ. Before that, I was saying, are you going to heaven? Yeah. Why? I was given a list of things. You know, go to church, I'm this and that. The fact is, the Bible says all your righteousnesses, the good things you can do when you're trying to use it for salvation, they're like filthy rags. And so before you do anything else about asking this question, why well, you got to know one thing. We are loved by God with an everlasting, everlasting love. He'll never change his heart towards you. God loves you. Now, the devil is the accuser of the brethren, and he will go before God and accuse us like he did with Job. The devil is a liar. Jesus told the Pharisees, ye are of your father the devil. Because <laughs> they weren't saved. They were very righteous, they thought, in their own ways, keeping the law to a T. Certainly we're going to go to heaven like we don't need God because we have our own righteousness. Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. He was a liar. <laughs> He's the father of lies. When, when Peter told Jesus, I won't let you go to the cross, remember he told Peter, get behind me. Satan. Now, Peter wasn't Satan, but, the, but to stop Jesus from going to the cross to pay for the sins of the world was a satanic thing. And God used other people, like King Herod, to kill all the babies, to try to get to the Christ child. Of course, it didn't happen. The devil's a liar, and he will tell you, you know what? Why would God allow this happen to you? Oh, God doesn't really love you. That's what the devil wants you to believe. But you know what? He's a liar. We must remember the truth and the fact that God loves us with an unconditional, everlasting love. And no matter what happens in this life, to make it seem that God doesn't love us, he loves us. In fact, Jesus said this in John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this. What? That a man lay down his life for his friends. Who's going to give their life for another person? Well, a parent might do it for a child. Secret service are paid to do it for the president, but 
John, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said there's no greater love than this, that a person, a man, would lay down his life for his friends. That's true love, amen? Number one, know this, God loves you. Second, this is important too, God's thoughts and his ways of, wor of working in the world and in our lives, not the same as ours. Not the same. Isaiah chapter 55, you know this verse, verses. Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. says, let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts, his ways and his thoughts. Let them forsake them. And let him return to the Lord and the Lord will have mercy on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Isn't that good that the, the most wicked person can come to Christ, repentant, turn to God, and in faith, trust him and be saved. You know, when uh, I think it was uh, James Dobson went into one of the Florida prisons, one of the prisoners was about to go to, I think, the electric chair. I think it was, uh, what was his name? The one that killed all these women. I can't think of it right. Huh? Ted. I don't like people with the name. I hope nobody hears name Ted. Ted Kennedy. Ted Bundy. <laughs> anyway, Ted Bundy, if you ever saw any things about his life, unbelievable. He even defended himself. How bold and arrogant. Anyway, he got what he deserved. But can Ted Bundy get saved? Well, what he did to these women and these young women? Well, if he comes to the point in his life where he repents and turns to Christ... Yes, he can, as much as we say, he deserves to go to a, a different kind of a hell. <laughs> well, God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Because he says right here, he'll have mercy, he'll abundantly pardon, and that, that may bother us a little. <laughs> and then he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, and they are, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts, in other words, higher than yours. God's different. I always say this, God, I'm glad God's not like me because <laughs> we've been wiped out a lot of people by now. God doesn't think the way we think. You know, when a person gets saved, you're thinking differently, or you should. You've got God's Holy Spirit now moving in into your body temple. And the Bible says the natural man, that's the unsaved mind, knows not the things of the Spirit, right? It's foolishness to him. They're spiritually discerned. And so when you trust Christ now, you've got God's Spirit that Jesus said in John 14 and 16, is going to teach you. It's going to be the comforter. It's going to seal you. It's going to empower you and do a whole... It's, it's God living in your body now, His Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete, the one that comes alongside. Aren't you glad that God loves us so much? He not only saves us, but then He said, I'm going to live in your body temple. I'm going to be there 24-7 to help you to grow because you know what? Your ways are not like mine and your thoughts are not like mine. And, and I need a lot of help. And we need God to help us so we can have his mind and the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. So we need that because our minds, <laughs> let me tell you, the older you get, the worse it gets. Even though the older you get, the more mature you get and the more like Christ you should be. We still have a physical body that breaks down. God doesn't think the way we think. <laughs> we're limited. We're, we're finite. We're temporal, right? He's eternal. He's infinite. You know, I'm like we like the way of the master, the way that uh, the brother goes out there and talks to people on the street, and you could see sometimes the, the countenance. The per he brings up the law, and that no one could keep the law. You liar. <laughs> you're, you're a thief, you're an adulterer at heart. And the guy says, yeah, but God will forgive me. And he says to him, you're making a God like you. You think God's like this. That's idolatry. That's not how the real God is. You're making a God after like man. And his, what he's saying in Isaiah is, no, God's not like us at all. His ways and his thoughts and the way of doing things are different than ours. And so why? That's why we ask why. Because we can't understand sometimes the heart of God. You know, here's the thing. God can do anything he pleases in any way he pleases. He's perfect. He's holy. He's powerful. Abraham said this, and this is one, a verse we need to memorize in these situations. Genesis 18, 25. He said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. That's the obvious answer. 
And in any situation when we must know that God has it, He's got this, as people say. He's in control. He doesn't work like we do. He doesn't think, praise the Lord, like I do. And he knows, and he's doing things for a reason. Like Jesus said about the the parents of the blind boy when they asked him, who sinned? No one. The works of God, we're going to do a miracle. Remember when Lazarus was, it was the reason why Jesus didn't go, that he was going to raise him and again do a mighty work, talking about the future resurrection of all of us. But Lazarus did die eventually, even though... He was raised from the dead because he died a human death. But Jesus wanted to know, I am the resurrection and the life. Though you were dead, you believe in me, you will live eternal life. In order to deal with this question Habakkuk had in the first word of verse 3 here, chapter 1, why? No, God loves you. He loves you. Unconditional. And then his thoughts and his ways are not like our thoughts and ways. And so when we question him and ask him why, (laughs) he's probably looking down saying, Frank, you're, you're a puny a human, not anywhere. I'm God. Don't question me. But, but we do. And it's not wrong, I don't think, to do that. But we must look. Well, God loves me. His ways are not like my ways, and his thoughts are not like my. And third, he has a different timetable than I have. <laughs> I want to look in the New Testament, 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. We're going to look at verse 8, 2 in a second. But 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord's not slack. Concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering, I'm, I'm glad about that, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to get saved. Not everyone will, but he wants that. He's not willing. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We saw that series, right? Thief in the night about the rapture. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Some people think that could be a nuclear holocaust, right? The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Everything on this world, not going to be like Noah's flood. That's never going to happen again. The world will not be destroyed by a flood, but by being burned up. The Lord in 2 Peter, speaking about his second coming. He's talking about the conclusion of human history on this earth as we know it. Of course, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. But 2 Peter 3, 8, look at this now, right before verse 9. Beloved, talking to Christians now, be not ignorant of this one thing. What's that? One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. He's not limited by time like we are. And a thousand years as one day. You have to realize God doesn't think like we do. His thoughts are different. His ways are different. He does love us unconditionally, but he's not on our timetable. It's like when we pray and we ask the Lord to do something, and we seem like God's not hearing. It's not happening the way I would like it to. God says, it's not, maybe it's not going to, because I'm God, and I'm going to take care of it. I, I will do it the way I think is best, according to his will. We want our problems, and I know I always do, right? Yesterday. We want healing. Uh, yesterday. We want souls saved by the thousands in central Oahu yesterday. We want to see all the politicians saved yesterday. Man. But we always think of the question of why we must remember God loves us. He thinks differently. He has a different timetable. Here's the thing. He's never late. (laughs) We may think he's late because we didn't see it happen fast enough, you know. God's able to do things over time that we never in our minds thought would ever be accomplished, all right? If you look back in your lives, when you went through tough times, you come out on the other side. Now, you, sometimes it takes that going through it and coming out and saying, now I can see what God was trying to do. I'm sure when uh, Dr. Merritt, Bruce Merritt from Wayne, New Jersey, moved to Florida to sort of semi-retire, opened up an office, 51 years old, you think he was thinking, well, I'm going to die soon, and uh, somebody else is going to come in here and take over my practice. Me. He wasn't thinking that. He wasn't a Christian. I'm sure he wasn't thinking of death at all. I'm sure he wasn't thinking of eternity and heaven and hell. As far as I know, he's in hell because he wasn't saved. But there was a lady there that knew the Lord that felt bad because she never talked to him about Christ, as she should. Now, is it her fault he's in hell? Well, she thinks it is. She feels like his blood is on her hands using the Old Testament story of the wall and protecting and warning. 
She never warned him. She felt like I could have said something. I knew him for years. Never, ever talked to him about the Lord. And she felt guilty about that. And then I came in. And she said, I'm going to work real hard on this guy. <laughs> now me, I came down there not knowing anything. I'm in a new place, very nervous, starting a new, not a new business, but in a new location. And she prayed. This woman was a godly woman. And every time she came in the office, the Bible was open. Not my Bible. Her Bible. I don't even think I own the Bible. It's a shame, right? And she would say, you're a sinner. If you died right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? I said, yes. <laughs> she said, really? How do you know that? Oh, well, I went through the list. You know, good Catholic. Bah, 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 bah. She said, the Bible says, A. What does it say there? What's that word? All. That means you. She pointed the finger right at me. Imagine. <laughs> I'm so glad that she did that. You know what? Looking back, that she would not let me rest in the fact that every time she came in, read this today and read that verse. It was all like the Romans wrote pretty much, most of the verses. Till we got to the Bible study, you know the story, I got saved. It took time. She was patient, of course, so I'm glad God was long-suffering with me. Amen? Patience. God is not in a rush. It's time to, do you know that the nation of Israel suffered many things? Uh, their, their captivity and, of course, uh, Nazi Germany, the Jews have always, God's people, whether Jew or Gentile, born again, always going to be attacked by the world. That, that's just a fact of life. Patience. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I'm not that kind of a person, unfortunately. God has taught me through tribulation to be more patient. Am I going to say I'm very patient now? I'm, I'm, I, I wish I could say that. But I'm getting there, I hope. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Listen to this in Romans, which is the book we just finished. Therefore, being justified by, not works, right, but faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, he says, not just in salvation and the hope, he says, but we also glory in tribulation. James says he rejoices in the trials of life. Romans, Paul wrote this letter to Rome, the Christians in Rome. We glory in tribulation also, he says, knowing that tribulation works patience. We need to have patience. We, we, we can't rush things and come to God as we say, why? I can't believe this is happening. Why are you not working? God said, I am working. You just don't see it. <laughs> and I don't have to answer you. He's not obligated. Tribulation. Somebody told me once, don't pray for patience. I said, I'm not very patient. Don't pray for patience. Well, whether you pray or not, God knows my heart. Tribulation that he brings to us, not because he hates us, because he wants us to be like him. He wants us to be patient. Habakkuk, Habakkuk asked God here in verse 3, chapter 1, why? He was crying out for answers. He, he saw his nation. It bothered him. Do you know, you're American. It should bother you what's happening. You know, we always say, well, I can't watch the news. I've got to turn it on. I'm getting sick of it. It's okay to be bothered by it, but what are we going to do about it? We go to the Lord. We cry out like he did. We know God loves us. He's not like us, his ways and his thoughts, all right? He's not on our timetable. And we just must say, God, we're trusting you to do whatever it takes. To do what? God wants people to be saved. He's long-suffering. That's the ultimate thing. God, use this. Use this COVID. Use this whatever's happening in our country and our government. Uh, to, to lead, be able to lead people to Christ, even if it means being in whatever, captivity. Could you, I can't believe I even said that word. The prophet cried out to God because of the condition of his nation. You know what? He knew judgment was coming, and judgment did come. Judgment came. Judgment may be coming to America. We you know several things we just said to help us through these times, and I hope we understand these things. And it may not change God's judgment on, on America. may not. And, and you know what? If it happens, we, we may not individually as believers feel like we deserve it. But as a nation, we, we deserve it if that happens. My last point, number four, and I'll be done. I'm, I'm going a few minutes over, and I apologize. 
Here's the answer to all this. The Lord Jesus Christ is the answer. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 through 9, Paul says, We walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, he says, and rather willing to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted by him. We're saved by faith. We are admonished to walk by faith and not by sight all the days of your Christian life on this earth. If we must have an answer to every question in life, here's what we're saying to the Lord. I want to live by sight now. I can't walk by faith unless, God, you let me know why. I have to see it. Demanding an answer by impatiently asking God, again, your motive, if it's just to have the answer, just to know God's heart. Why is like saying, Lord, I, I must have some sight in this thing I'm going through. I need to see the reason. We can't go forward, Lord, unless you show me your plan. That's what we're saying. What we need to do and what God wants us to do is just simply place our faith in him and in Christ. We must depend upon him when there seems to be no answer. We sing, only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now until the problem comes up. <laughs> we sing, faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Is, is that the song we just sing? I like that song, I do like that song, but is it, is that, yes it is the victory. And we learn many things as we go through this book. We're just starting only the first four verses of Habakkuk. I don't believe we can learn anything more important than the principle is this. We must stop trying to get God to give us an answer now and start looking for the victory that's already in the Lord. As I say often, we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from it. We already have it. The short book, as you'll see, of Habakkuk is about trusting God. Our faith must be in him and him alone. 1 John 5, 4, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. What? Our faith. Our faith. Jesus not only has the answer to life's greatest why questions, he is the answer. He is the answer. And the message about the book of Habakkuk is a message of faith in God. It's a lesson that I know I need, and I think we all need in this day we live in, and the day Habakkuk lived in as well. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for even, Lord, you saved by grace. We're saved through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Even the faith to trust you is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank you, Lord, for drawing us to yourself. And we place our faith and trust in you, turn from sin, repentance and you saved our souls when we don't deserve it we don't understand that but we don't ask why we say thank you and lord help us uh, in this life as things uh, seem to be dim in our country and in the world know that you love us with an everlasting love you are not like us your ways and your thoughts are higher much higher than ours and lord that uh, we need to wait patiently on you and trust you, that you have our best interests. Lord, you said in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. To those who love you and are called according to your purpose, Lord, help us to see your way through uh, dark days that we go through, and days may get darker. And Lord, help us to trust you even through those, even through the very point of death. You said, the day though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me, Lord. Thank you for your presence in all of our lives. Help us to trust you more. Help us to glorify you, all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.